right. Well, thank you to the organizers for spearheading this timely event. I know these things are effortful and your, all your efforts are worth it in the long run, hopefully. So what I want to talk to you about today is um, my personal experience in attempting to increase diversity in uh, social science. I'm primarily trained in developmental science, so I'll be using examples uh, from the developmental psychological literature as well as the cognitive anthropological literature. But I think a lot of the, the examples that I'm going to provide and a lot of the suggestions that I have apply to social science more broadly. So these are not specific to developmental science. Um, so my goal here is to provide you with a bit of a roadmap for some best practice based on uh, my firsthand experience attempting to integrate both psychological and anthropological uh, research. So the first thing I want to talk about is why I do cross-cultural comparison. Um, one of the things that I've attempted to do in trying to convince experimental psychologists in particular that cross-cultural comparison is important is to emphasize the um, really extraordinary scientific value of doing cross-cultural comparison. Um, and the fact that we really need to do this in order to improve our, our theories, um, uh, successful application, so I think a lot about the nature of humans as cultural animals. Uh, this always gets kind of snickers when I present this to psychologists, thinking of humans as animals is not always something that's especially um, accepted. On, on some level, of course, people know that humans are animals, but they, um, they are, and I think a lot about the continuities between humans and um, non-human primates. Humans, I think, are easily the most cultural of all animals. Examining the capacity for culture requires understanding the differences between uh, human and non-human learning capacities. Uh, there's quite a lot of research on that. The ontogeny of those capacities, which is something I'm especially interested in, um, and their expression across diverse uh, human groups. And I approach understanding both the evolution and ontogeny of cultural learning and social transmission um, through a variety of different uh, disciplinary perspectives and use uh, methods from developmental, comparative, um, cognitive, and cross-cultural psychology and anthropology to, to tackle this. And I also use multiple methods, uh, experimental, um, my PhD is in experimental psychology, development, developmental or experimental psychology. I also do a lot of observational research, um, some ethnography, um, and increasingly longitudinal research in a variety of different cultural contexts. So my goal here is to examine the psychological foundations of cultural transmission practices. So one example of that would be teaching, uh, which is hypothesized to be a kind of universal um, feature of human culture, as well as cultural acquisition strategies. So trying to understand the role of the child as a consumer of cultural information, as well as a creator of it. And I've done this research in um, a great variety of different places, including uh, South Africa, that's where I did my research in graduate school, um, Brazil, China, and more recently in, uh, in Vanuatu, which I'll talk quite a bit about. So our large brains aside, what, how does, or what makes human cognition different from other, uh, other primates? Lots of different ways that you can tackle this question. Um, one of the ways that I've started studying this, um, and I think one contender for explaining cross-species variation, uh, in our cognition is the ways is ways in which humans acquire culture, which is through our social learning. Now we know our prolonged early development uh, sets humans apart from other primates. Uh, as an altricial species, our offspring are dependent on adults for survival for sometimes decades, like three decades or more. And this extended uh, juvenile period increases opportunities for social learning. So there's an extended period to acquire the beliefs and practices and routines and skills of um, whichever human group you're a part of. Um, and that's really at the core of what I'm trying to understand. We know that humans are psychologically prepared to learn from others. Uh, young children, like those you see here, um, which are from the field site that I work in in Tana Vanuatu, are highly adept at acquiring whatever practices they need to acquire. Now, the range of different skills that um, children need to acquire vary tremendously across populations, as do the way in which that information is transmitted. So if you want to develop some model of how we acquire culture, how we transmit culture, studying this within only one population is problematic. Human groups differ tremendously in 
along a great variety of different um, continua, but technological complexity, social complexity, all of these things vary tremendously. So in attempting to try to understand our capacity for cognitive flexibility or social learning, looking um, both within and between populations for variation is, is critical. So I'll start with just a definition of culture, lots of different ways that you could define this. Um, I define it as group typical behaviors shared by members of a community that rely on socially learned and transmitted uh, information. Um, in the case of human culture, that would also include things like institutions and other kind of complex um, social values and um, routines. And in giving talks about doing cross-cultural comparison and why it's important, one of the things that I've attempted to do is, is emphasize how kind of scientifically rich uh, and distinctive cultural variability is among humans. Um, and our cultural variability is one of our species' most distinctive features. So rather than viewing cultural variation as this noise that's kind of irritating and obscuring what is universal about human nature, which is often how cultural variation is portrayed or understood, um, or variation of any kind. It's not just cultural variation, it's often individual differences, right? There's far less known about individual differences in the field than there, um, there should be. Um, but actually, this is, I think this is where the most interesting aspects of human um, cognition and behavior are. Now, if social learning explains cultural transmission, at least in part, the mechanism should be at least to some extent universal. So you should find some evidence of teaching or motivated transmission behavior everywhere. You should find that children imitate behavior everywhere. And indeed, we do find that. But these mechanisms for becoming a cultural animal have to be responsive to diverse ontogenetic contexts and cultural ecologies. So the extraordinary feature or accomplishment of the human cognitive system I think, is its flexibility, its adaptability. Uh, a child born into any human group on the planet is perfectly capable and will successfully, um, barring abnormal development, acquire the language, acquire the practices, basically everything they know, need to know to be a successful human. And this requires an enormous amount of flexibility. So what I'm attempting to do in my own research program uh, is to explain the features and functions of uh, human culture, its extraordinary complexity, its diversity, as I've mentioned, as well as how it has evolved. Uh, these are pictures of imitation meant to showcase that children imitate for a great variety of different reasons. So um, in some cases, they imitate the behavior of others to learn instrumental skills, important practices that ensure their success within a group. Um, but they also imitate for purely social reasons, right? To affiliate with important um, members of their family, like their father, for example. So what I want to talk to you uh, about just briefly is why I'm so interested in cumulative culture and why I think thinking about cultural transmission and acquisition provides a nice framework for thinking about cross-cultural research on social learning. Uh, then I want to talk a bit about cognition and context, which I think is the, the way forward for the field of social science, um, and some suggestions for how psychologists can make progress on that. And then I want to, to talk a bit about, um, well, what I and, and many others think would be um, a really productive future for social science, um, ways that um, we can make progress in doing successful interdisciplinary research, including training, um, and that this, these improvements in social science will allow us to keep pace with uh, cultural evolution. I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by that, as well as explain and ad adapt to cultural change. So human populations are changing at an extraordinary, extraordinarily rapid rate. Um, Vanuatu is in, in the South Pacific. It's a, I mean, I go there because it's a very remote population with very low levels of Western-style education, low levels of participation in the market economy. Um, there's still some practitioners of indigenous religions. Every time my students and I go back, every two years, more of the children are going to school, more of the, the, the villages are participating in a market economy, more are attending Christian churches. So these populations are... are experiencing really unprecedented rates of extremely rapid change. And we need the tools to be able to capture the psychological consequences of, of globalization and 
and the rapid change of, of human groups. So technological and social complexity are the outcome of our spe species' remarkable capacity for cumulative culture, where innovations build on, um, build on each other and are progressively incorporated into a population's stock of, of skills and knowledge. This generates ever more sophisticated repertoires. Now, cumulative culture is um, useful in a number of ways, but it's especially useful because it allows us to build upon the insights of previous generations. So humans are, are special because they don't have to acquire all the knowledge they need to learn every single generation. It's very hard to make any progress in accumulating information if there's no way to store it and acquire it from others. So we're, we're motivated to, uh, to do this. So the, um, I mean, one of the things that I'm, I think is so interesting here is that this makes humans, um, in many cases, our capacity to acquire information from others, uh, including information that's stored over many, many generations, uh, can make humans appear far more um, cognitively sophisticated than they would ever be in isolation, right? Um, and I think this has set our, our genus on an evolutionary pathway quite distinct from all other species. So since humans and chimpanzees have shared a common ancestor, the inventory of human tools has gone from a handful of stone implements uh, to a technological repertoire capable of replicating DNA, splitting atoms, uh, and even things like interplanetary travel. And most of this technological complexity in human culture has occurred within the, the past few thousand years with really exponential growth within the last I would say 200 years or so. So I'm, I'm interested in, in trying to understand the, the implications of change that occurs at a pace that rapid. Um, I think that's one of the um, frontiers of social science. Now in the same evolutionary time span, the chimpanzee toolkit has remained relatively rudimentary, uh, although fascinating and far more sophisticated than we used to think. Um, relatively speaking, um, there has not been the same kind of um, ramping up in complexity. So how can we explain this wide divergence in technological complexity between such closely related primate species? Many contenders for this, of course. Um, but one possibility is that tool innovation is a part of the story. And this is how we explain technological complexity in human culture. Um, so maybe our capacity to construct new tools um, or use old to tools in new ways has provided the kind of critical fodder for um, technological complexity over the course of human history. So this is where doing developmental research, I think, is tremendously interesting, um, and also doing developmental research cross-culturally. Right? So if, if this is the case, if innovation is really a critical distinguishing characteristic um, in explaining human cultural complexity, we might expect it to be early developing, like walking or language acquisition. Right? Um, and we know that young children are brilliant in a great variety of different ways. They're deeply inquisitive. Um, they are really interested in learning about the world around them. Right? Decades of research on this particular topic. I mean, you can put young children in situations where they look extraordinarily um, scientific-like. So they're interested in, in testing hypotheses under certain conditions and discovering underlying um, causal mechanism, mechanisms of systems. There's actually very little evidence for precocious innovation. Young children aren't very good at tool innovation. Um, I would say they're shockingly bad given how good they are at other things, like learning languages, for example, or engaging in high-fidelity imitation. So in fact, um, New Caledonian crows and great apes actually outperform young children in many tasks, uh, many tool innovation tasks. And this is, I think, especially striking given that um, our species is characterized by technological and social innovations. Uh, There's a disconnect between what young children do readily and what we see in, in, in human culture. Um, so how does a species with offspring who are so bad at, at solitary tool innovation um, I think that's a critical caveat, becomes so good at it. And um, I think one explanation for this is that cultural evolution makes individuals more innovative by allowing for the accumulation of prefabricated uh, solutions 
to problems that can be combined to create new technologies. So young children can kind of put together insights and information from other people in novel ways. And that is actually something young children are, um, are quite good at. So behavioral combination is something kids can do. And keep in mind, the subcomponents of a lot of our modern technology are far too complex uh, for individuals to develop from scratch anyway. So to characterize young children as especially bad at innovation is a little unfair, given that adults are also pretty bad at this as well. So children learn cumulative culture. That's a big part of what they're attempting to do. And we know they're highly precocious social learners. Um, they're motivated to learn from and imitate others, and this, of course, allows them to benefit from um, the information others have. And cumulative culture requires the high-fidelity transmission of two different kinds of practices, uh, instrumental skills, like how to keep warm during the winter, as well as rituals, like how to perform a ceremonial dance. Children acquire these skills through um, uh, imitation behavioral conformity, and again, this is perfectly functional. This requires them to learn information very, very, very rapidly. Um, information far more complex than they could discover individually. One of the things I've spent a lot of time doing um, empirical work on, including cross-cultural research on, is teaching. So there's evidence teaching is a human universal, yet it varies enormously in, um, in frequency, also in the modality. Um, by modality, I mean whether information is transmitted physically through tactile um, contact or through visual contact, through um, verbal instruction, enormous variation there. And, and that's true within and between populations. So teaching is a, is a really great way to understand um, cultural variation as well as you know, universality. One of the things I've spent a, a lot of time thinking about is how to explain the children's psychological preparation to become members of social groups. I've done this by studying rituals, which are psychologically um, prepared, cultural, culturally tr transmitted behavioral trademarks of our species, the fact that rituals are social group practices and are socially stipulated, as well as uh, physically over or opaque from the perspective of physical causality, I think makes them ideally suited for high fidelity cultural transmission. So it's another reason I'm interested in trying to understand them. Rituals are also especially curious because they promote high fidelity copying, but inhibit individual level innovation. So if you're trying to understand technological and social complexity, the fact that, that ritual practices as well as instrumental skills are uh, characteristically human, I think is, is interesting. Because these, these two different category, categories of behavior have different demands in terms of imitation versus innovation. So the unique demands of acquiring instrumental skills and rituals provides insight, I think, into when children engage in high fidelity imitation, when they innovate, and to what degree. We've done a, um, a number of experimental studies demonstrating that, and this is, we've done these studies with children and adults. Uh, we started with Western populations, children in Austin, Texas, and found that when learning instrumental skills, with an increase in experience, high fidelity imitation uh, decreases over time and innovation increases. When learning rituals, we find just the opposite. Imitative fidelity stays high regardless of experience. So this isn't just an effect of kind of lack of knowledge where it would make sense if you don't have a lot of information about a behavior, you would imitate with high fidelity because you don't know what you can omit. Um, but imitate, or sorry, innovation stays low over time. The whole function of ritual is to promote um, group level coordination, cohesion, and high fidelity imitation and behavioral conformity um, support that. So we've got evidence that from a number of empirical studies that children differentiate um, and respond flexibly to instrumental tasks versus rituals. I'm assuming this is a core feature, or hypothesizing this is a core feature of cultural transmission. Uh, and yet all of the, at least all of our early data are from children that are living in technologically complex populations and participating in formal education. So we've done cross-cultural comparisons. Um, the reason why I think Vanuatu is an especially interesting um, case study for this particular question is that the, the population differs tremendously in how information um, 
is uh, transmitted over generations, how children are instructed. So children participate in a, an apprenticeship style um, model uh, of education. They learn heavily through observation. So they're acquiring information in, in different ways um, in Vanuatu versus the US. And as I mentioned, formal education is um, a fairly recent introduction um, into Vanuatu or in Tana in particular. So I'm interested in, in both describing variation between the populations as well as explaining variation. And it's a difficult thing to fit to do both within just one study. Um, accomplishing this requires many, many, many different studies, um, a variety of different methodologies, and really convergent sources of, of information. So one of the things we've done is these imitation studies where we looked at imitative um, fidelity and flexibility. And what we find is that children in Vanuatu, just like children in the US, imitate ritual or conventional practices with higher fidelity than instrumental tasks. So there's some evidence that this is a, um, might be a pervasive way of kind of cleaving the, the human landscape um, and, and very useful for understanding the um, kind of functional practices within human culture. But just documenting this doesn't explain um, you know, where this distinction would come from. Um, it also doesn't explain some of the variation that we found. So we found that, that children in Vanuatu do make this distinction. They imitate ritual tasks with higher fidelity, but they imitate overall with higher fidelity than US kids. So there's higher imitative fidelity in Vanuatu than the US, right? So how do we explain this, um, this difference? So you could appeal to different cultural expectations for conformity, right? There might be greater expectations for conformity in Vanuatu. It's more of a collectivist society. Um, there's a very strong emphasis on obedience and hierarchy and things like this. So this might explain it, um, but, but of course that, that's a hypothesis that needs to be tested. So one of the ways that we uh, have attempted to move from describing this variation to, or to begin to explain it uh, is to use methods from another discipline. So we used multivocal ethnography, and all that entails is showing video of behavior from one population to another, and basically asking both groups to explain it. So we did this in the case of um, these imitation tasks. So we showed adults in the US and Vanuatu videos of children in those populations engaging in low versus high conformity behavior. So children that imitate a task perfectly and children that imitate a task with low fidelity, a task that was modeled by an experimenter, and then just simply asked which one of the uh, children is more intelligent. Um, and we don't mention any, we don't describe the behavior, so they're using the behavioral information to make this inference. We ask about intelligence, we also ask about how good the behavior is. Um, and what we find is that US adults Right, the low conformity child is most intelligent. And they give explanations, and by US adults, I mean middle class, Euro-American, highly educated adults. So they rate the low conformity child as most intelligent. And they give the kinds of explanations you would probably predict. Uh, they cite creativity, they cite innovation, um, they say things like, oh, this child's gonna be a future leader, clearly. Um, and really, the only basis for this is that the, the child engaged in low conformity behavior. Um, in Vanuatu, we find just the opposite. The high conformity children are rated as most intelligent. And the explanations that adults in Vanuatu are giving are not about obedience. They're really about cognitive effort. And they're pointing out it actually takes quite a bit of memory to remember the details of behavior someone else has modeled. Um, so they actually express concern about the low conformity children as quite um, incapable of even a, a fairly basic task, right? So, the interpretation of things like competence, it, it varies tremendously. And this, and this is enormously cons consequential for uh, thinking about how to design you know, educational instruction and, so, and, and, and think through how children are, um, are evaluated. So here's just one example of how you know, we've, we have evidence that there is a greater emphasis on conformity within that population, but the way conformity is understood and its implications for intelligence vary, uh, vary quite a bit. So we know that the dearth of, of systematic research outside of Western populations 
presents a major impediment to theoretical progress in um, social sciences in general, and I think the developmental sciences in particular. So my strategy for um, evangelizing um, and trying to convince others to take cultural diversity seriously is really to emphasize the fact that our theories are limited without these data, that we actually we do need these data. Um, as a few other speakers have, have mentioned thus far, um, we've done quite a bit of um, analysis of the um, empirical literature in top developmental journals uh, and have found that children in uh, the most populous portions of the world, Africa, Asia, uh, South America, are least represented in, um, in the highest impact developmental journals. So there's still a, a kind of wide gap between what the field on some level knows needs to be done and what is actually being done. Uh, I still am immensely surprised that there are, there are twice as many papers published on non-human primates. It's only 2% um, in the developmental literature, but still. Uh, Two percent of the papers are from non-human primates in the highest impact developmental journals, and only one percent are from children from the entirety of Africa and South America. Um, right. So, just a reminder to my colleagues that uh, this is a problem that um, many people need to tackle. Right. This is not something that a small group of, of fearless cross-cultural soldiers can tackle alone. Um, Personally, I don't think I can be single-handedly responsible for studying children in South America and, and Africa. I think it's a collective responsibility of the, the field. And I hope it's not controversial to say that the future of social science requires contextualizing um, the study of human cognition and behavior. I know people have been, cultural psychologists have been talking about this for decades. Of course, anthropologists, this is their, their bread and butter. Um, but research across diverse human populations is necessary to better understand the ontogeny of a species that inhabits a great variety of ecologies. So I tackle this by use, taking kind of an evolutionary lens, a functional lens, and understanding uh, variation. So if we want to understand something like the ontogeny of cumulative culture, we have to ex understand how it changes over the lifespan. As a developmental psychologist, I'm deeply interested in that but also how it varies in a, I mean, ideally, strategically selected set of cultural contexts. Um, they vary along theoret theoretically relevant um, variables. So moving beyond just convenient sampling to study cultural diversity to being more systematic and selecting comparisons that are theoretically relevant. So to investigate the psychological capacities that enable cumulative cultural transmission, it's critical to look at variation. For example, if I was interested in trying to understand teaching, which I am, and I studied this only in middle class Euro-American families, my understanding of what teaching is, how pervasive it is, the style in which it occurs, would be massively unrepresentative of the practices around much of the rest of the world. Um, in fact, the heavily, heavy reliance on didactic pedagogy and direct instruction within the West is extraordinarily rare if you look around the world in places like Vanuatu. Um, so you, in fact, mischaracterize a, a universal, quote unquote, universal behavior by not studying cultural diversity. So one of the things that I've been very interested in more recently is trying to understand um, the ecological and social factors that impact cultural transmission and acquisition. Um, and this is really in the service of attempting to explain variation and not just describe it. So without, without demographic information, without information about the local ecology, the school system, the family dynamics, it's very difficult to explain a cultural difference when you find it, which is why in, um, in much of the literature in cross-cultural developmental psychology, and there's a, a kind of nod to potential candidates for explaining variation, but there's no actual evidence for, um, for what, um, what, what explains it. So to document variation within and between species, or sorry, um, within and between groups, you need to select um, really multiple different variables and try to understand these. You, so one example of something you might want to understand are kind of local ecological challenges. Things like material insecurity and group conflict. So most psychologists doing cross-cultural comparison um, 
spend very little time in a population and would have very, very little information indeed about these sorts of variables, um, although they're absolutely critical to understanding cultural variation. Participation in the global economic marketplace, that varies. That's part of the reason that I work in, in Vanuatu. So um, information about income and modes of subsistence. Right? That's, as we've discussed quite a bit, those are, that kind of information is rarely included in a method section, um, primarily because it's not collected in the first place. Uh, information about social organization, so whether society is more hierarchical, more egalitarian, um, lots of other ways that you can study social organization, of course. Urbanization, so thinking about population density, right? This is incredibly consequential for thinking about how information is transmitted. Kinship networks, whether they're primarily nuclear, extended family um, habitation. Formal education is, is really critical. Things like uh, parental literacy, um, years of schooling of children and caregivers, how families actually think about education, the degree to which it's useful or not. Um, I will point, I was talking to, to Megan earlier today, this is not something you have to study internationally. Right? There's enormous variation in how people think about education, its function, um, its utility within, a, uh, within the same country, within the same community. So um, certainly not all populations within a country experience education in the same way. Having lived in, in Texas for a number of years, um, that is a very salient part of, um, of my own research program. And also thinking through both horizontal and vertical transmission. Right? So is information primarily transmitted through, um, through parents, through teachers, through peers? Uh, obviously, the, the literature in developmental psychology focuses very, very, very heavily well, on individual children. Um, but if another person is added to that dynamic, it's usually the parent, sometimes the teacher, um, or an unfamiliar adult. Very, very little known about how peers transmit information to each other, despite the fact that that is where children spend a lot of their time, um, at least around the world. So in addition to examining between group differences, um, I also want to under, understand variation um, at the kind of individual level and, of course, to uh, explain that within and between groups. So I'm looking for convergent evidence across um, multiple different methods and data sources. Uh, I'm, I, th I think that the more um, the advantage of mixed methodologies is that you can converge upon um, ideas from a variety of different ways. So every single methodology is limited in some substantial way. One way to get around this is to use more than one. Uh, and I'm interested in examining the interaction of variables and explaining their effects on cognition and cumulative cultural transmission. So all this means that it's insufficient to go into a population for two and a half weeks with, and do one task with a group of um, four to six year olds and get the, your you know, dependent variable of interest and then move on from there, right? You need to spend much more time to understand the local context, the local ecology. Uh, it's also much more time consuming to get all the different sorts of information that you, um, that you might want. So I wanna talk just briefly about some best practice um, that I've gleaned from the research program that I've uh, just described as well as research I've done in the past. So one thing I find effective is making research questions relevant to core psychological topics. Um, and and by the, I don't mean this in a trivial way. I mean engaging with the core topics in the field you're attempting to impact and really going the extra step to make clear why studying variation is relevant to, to core psychological questions. Having a diverse repertoire of research methods so that your questions uh, can guide the methods you use rather than the other way around. All right, so one limitation for mixed methodological interdisciplinary research is that very few scientists are trained in using more than one type of method. Right? It's very common to have, to be a vignette person or um, uh, to be trained on a very, very limited set of, of tasks, which are often insufficient to study immensely complex populations. Um, conducting ideally theoretically motivated uh, cultural comparisons Convenient samples are useful in a number of different ways, um, but they're also very limited in, um, in what they can tell us. Moving beyond description to explanation, 
also collaborating in building research infrastructure. Obviously, we, the, the, the gold standard here would be to compare behavior across multiple different populations, and this is well beyond the scope of um, a single PI, right? So this requires collaboration with um, people across, across different, um, different parts of the world in a sustainable research infrastructure. Also, balancing methodological rigor with ecological validity. That's a critical part of, of why I, or one of the core reasons why I use both anthropological as well as psychological methods. So ideally, we want um, both of those things. And as a reminder, social science has a treasure trove of methodological tools and techniques. One of my favorite things to do is to discover new methods. So they're out there, and we should be making greater use of them. Here are just a few examples, experiments, observation, interviews. Uh, there's, there are many different options, and I, I would argue we need to be using all of these and more um, to try to explain cultural variation. There's also been an enormous amount of progress in, um, in the software for coding uh, qualitative data. So we can now quantify qualitative data um, in, ways, in more efficient ways than ever before. And I think this is an enormous, um, enormously useful um, uh, progression in the field. Um, the movement towards open science is obviously incredibly helpful uh, and transparency, also making data available. Uh, so Heidi Keller and I were talking earlier about um, making video data that she's collected in her field site over the years available to others to code. So one of the, the, the roadblocks for more people studying cultural diversity is just access to populations. If we, we had video data or other sources of information that were more widely available through easily accessible databases, um, I think this would be a, a useful thing. So in terms of motivating comparison, I think looking across age, culture, also species is, um, is critical. Ex examining cultural diversity uh, enriches social science, I and mean, this provides insight into uh, cognitive and cultural evolution, which is why I, um, why I do it. And just a, a final note, just something I've been thinking uh, quite a bit about more recently and as a new line of research in my lab, is thinking about how to keep pace with cultural evolution. Right? So I've, I mentioned that the massive increase in technological complexity, the rate of cultural and technological change has far outpaced the rate at which uh, social science has uh, accommodated and adjusted to, to study it, and we need to, to tackle this. This has impacted our ability to study change and understand its implications for behavior, cognition, and learning. Social science obviously has a lot of insights for improving interventions, application, promoting good outcomes, and, uh, and using a more diverse methodological toolkit will allow us to be more, um, more timely. So the cultural inheritance of technologies allows for this explosive growth of cultural complexity. Uh, cumulative culture, I think, can explain um, the acceleration of cultural change. Um, understanding cumulative culture and harnessing it to provide solutions to global problems is, I think, another um, interesting direction for future research. And this requires studying the psychology that enable people to acquire, transmit, um, and discover new information. This should be studied horizontally within generations and vertically across generations. And this requires an interdisciplinary social science. So one of the, the long-term solutions for fixing this diversity problem is to start doing research that transcends and, and um, moves across disciplinary boundaries. That's a non-trivial obstacle, but I really do think that is what will be required. And harnessing insights about the human mind will allow us to increase technological innovation, um, hopefully increase things like tolerance for cultural diversity and um, promote more inclusive societies. So for this new kind of social science uh, for the 21st century, the um, three-pronged approach that I'm um, advocating for is integrating biological and social science um, supporting um, things like computational modeling, database building, and open science initiatives, um, uh, using mixed methods, and this thing will put research, um, this will put research in social science really at the cutting edge of tackling pressing global problems. <laughs>